Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Expedited U.S. FDA Development and Approval Programs for Serious Conditions, presented by Roe. I'm Andrea Anderson, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Our speakers today are Jenna Kingen, Associate Director, Regulatory Strategy, Roe, and David Shoemaker, Senior Vice President, R&D, Roe. You can read their full bios on the left side of your window by selecting the Speakers tab. Just a few technical notes before we begin. If you'd like to download the slide deck, please click the Handouts tab button on the left side of your screen. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please just make sure your volume is up. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand within 24 hours after the event. Time permitting, we will follow the presentations with a Q&A session. Please submit your questions using the Questions and Answers tab on the left side of your screen. All right, let's begin. Jenna, please go ahead. Thank you and welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. I know David and I are excited to talk to you about um, some of the programs um, that represent the efforts that FDA um, has for us really to address those unmet medical needs in the treatment of serious conditions. So I'm going to start with a few introductory slides, um, listing the programs, and a few concepts to cover before we get into the meat of the presentation. All right. So again, these are the programs um, to help address unmet medical needs and serious conditions, um, and we'll talk through them in this order. Um, um, I'll touch on breakthrough therapy designation, also, you might hear me say BTD, um, and then Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy designation, also known as RMAT, this is a bit newer designation. And then I'll hand the baton over to David. He'll talk through accelerated approval, priority review, fast track, and then touch on some other programs for some specific populations um, for anti-infective products. And then a note here that you may hear us um, speak to that a product may qualify for more than one of the programs uh, that we're talking through today. Okay, so a few concepts here. Um, we think it's important to understand when we're talking about um, these different expedited product development programs is what is serious and life-threatening uh, disease or condition. Um, here up on the screen, we've got the definition per the regs. Um, I won't read, read it to you line by line, but just kind of pointing out it's associated with morbidity that has that substantial impact on day-to-day -day functioning. So whether it's serious, it is a matter of clinical judgment, um, really based on the impact um, of survival, of day-to-day -day functioning. Um, and really, if, if it's left untreated, it can progress to a, very, a more serious condition. And then available therapy. So this is kind of in terms of an existing treatment or if there's existing therapy. Um, so when we speak about available therapy today, um, consider that means it's, it's a product that's improved or that it's been licensed in the U.S. for that same indication being considered for the product under development. And also um, available therapy is a definition or, or relevant to what might be considered current U.S. standard of care. So for example, if a product may be used off-label currently um, to treat a specific disease or condition, um, but is considered standard of care for that particular condition, that would be considered an available therapy. And then a last um, kind of concept here before we get into the different programs, um, unmet medical need. So this is where a condition whose treatment or the diagnosis is not adequately addressed by available therapy. So under a few categories here. So where there's no available therapy, so we just talked through um, the definition of that on the previous slide. And then second here is if the product um, or if there's an advance beyond the available therapy um, in which um, we've got these sub bullets, so better having better efficacy, um, an improved benefit over risk profile or definite advantage of the product. And then lastly, um, unmet medical need is where there's only another ex or a, an accelerated approval product exists. 
um, where that clinical be benefit of that product has not yet been validated. All right, so I'm going to take you through um, some notes on breakthrough therapy designation, or BTD. So what products are eligible for breakthrough therapy designation? Um, well, this a serious or life-threatening disease, um, which we've talked through. And kind of a high bar here is this, this last bullet, preliminary clinical evidence that indicates the product may be substantially um, be a substantial improvement over an existing therapy on one or more clinically significant endpoints. So that's got a lot of details in there, um, and we'll unpack those in a little bit. But really pointing out clinical evidence, substantial improvement over existing therapies, and clinically significant endpoints. So those are some key takeaways. For benefits, so what are the benefits of breakthrough therapy designation? Um, so you get this you know, pretty intense involvement from FDA. We've got senior management helping to facilitate some multidisciplinary meetings and a process. Um, and I have to say, I've been involved with a few breakthrough therapy products. Um, and one, um, for example, was for a rare pediatric disease. And we were meeting and preparing meeting packages for FDA almost every other month. Um, some cases it was a teleconference, some, some cases it was in person. But it was a lot of rapid um, communication and pulling together packages. Whereas for another product that I was um, involved with in breakthrough therapy, it was a bit more of a strategic approach, I would say, in comparison. Um, and I think bottom line here is, in any case, whether you have a designation or not, you really need to consider um, your strategic approach in speaking with the FDA to make sure you have the right data package to make sure you have the justification um, or kind of that leg to stand on with the FDA. Um, some other benefits, breakthrough therapy, you've got timely responses, because um, FDA is kind of really on board to help um, that efficient product development during all phases um, of your development. And then the last bullet here, rolling review, um, which is different than what you may have heard of a rolling submission. This rolling review um, is, when you're submitting sections of your marketing application um, as they are completing with the anticipation of FDA reviewing those. So you do um, typically get agreement with the FDA to review those, but separate from a rolling submission in which you might just submit sections of your marketing application and they just kind of sit until your full application is submitted. All right, back. Um, so obtaining breakthrough therapy designation, well, you've got that kind of high bar requirement for that preliminary clinical evidence um, that we'll talk a little bit more in the next few slides, so having that robust data package. So um, you can submit an application um, before, anytime before marketing, any anytime before you submit your marketing application. Um, and in this case, because you do need clinical data, you'll be at least, you know, into phase one, phase one, two, for example. The sponsor requests this designation, and then if all criteria are met, the FDA will grant this within 60 days. All right, so there's those two kind of key points of that preliminary clinical evidence. So must show substantial improvement. So here we're talking about rigorous studies, having a robust data set. Um, so uh, controlled studies versus current therapy, placebo, historical control. Um, so really having strong evidence um, as well as clinical meaningfulness um, and also substantial improvement may be safety advantages versus a current study or excuse me, a current therapy. Um, in the examples um, that I mentioned earlier, I'm just giving you an idea of what we've seen or what we've experienced with that particular data package. In the rare pediatric disease breakthrough therapy designation, um, there was a data package um, with a, just a handful of subjects because it was a rare pediatric disease um, in phase one, and they compared this to age and disease match control his, uh, natural history cohort. So that's the data that they had presented or that, that the content of the, the number of subjects. Um, 
and then alternatively in this other example um, I brought up, uh, this data package included one of two parts of a phase two dose ranging study, which ended up having um, placebo group as well as um, three different dose groups. Um, so a total of about 260 patients. Um, so to give you kind of a little flavor um, of the data and the, the number of subjects that we've seen. All right, and then um, kind of that second portion of the requirement for preliminary clinical evidence is having a clinically significant endpoint um, to show. So that's an effect on irreversible morbidity or mortality. Um, so some examples here is uh, are an effect on a validated surrogate endpoint. Um, now in many cases, especially if it's a rare disease, for example, um, you may not have a validated surrogate endpoint but hopefully um, getting data around that to validate it. Um, an effect on a surrogate endpoint or intermediate endpoint that's reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. And I know David may go a little bit deeper into surrogate and intermediate clin clinically, excuse me, clinical endpoints a little bit later in this talk. Um, also maybe clinically significant endpoint, improved safety profile. And then in some rare cases, you might see um, or be able to use a pharmacodynamic biomarker. And I'll just go back to those two example cases um, again to give you an idea of the, the type of clinically significant endpoint um, that they were proposing to use. So one was a patient reported outcome, a PRO, in which along with their breakthrough therapy designation submission um, and submitting the data, they had some appendices to show their development and contributions um, to the qualitative and quantitative validation of that particular endpoint. Okay, and with any type of program um, or expedited, you know, development of uh, a product development, there are challenges. So in particular for breakthrough therapy designation, there is a low success rate that we've seen. Over the years, it's gotten a little bit better. Maybe the last, um, about 40% um, the last time we checked. Uh, so it's kind of important to really understand this type of designation understand the data package required uh, here, this second bullet point, um, suggesting that a lot of the successful applications are from larger pharma groups with more experienced regulatory staff. Um, they really understand a bit more the quality and the quantity of data required. And something else to point out, a challenge. So while your clinical program um, might be, you know, streaming ahead, getting agreement with FDA to move forward with specific studies or exposures um, that might help expedite the program, you really need to keep in mind what your CMC development, manufacturing development program looks like, for example. Um, if, if you're well-versed in product development, there are many times just in um, well, quote-unquote normal product development without these expedited um, pathways in which CMC ends up being critical path. So you really need to think about all the different disciplines, all the different components of your marketing application um, when you are approaching these different expedited pathways. All right. Okay, I'm gonna move on now to Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy Designation, or RMAT. This is a newer program. Um, the intent is to support um, the acceleration in developing new innovations and advances to patients. So it is specific to biologic project or biologic um, products. Um, and here defining that a product is a regenerative medicine therapy um, under these, these four sub bullet cell therapies, therapeutic tissue engineering products, human cell and tissue products, and then a co combination of those above. How, I do want to point out that however, a human cell tissue and cellular tissue-based product, so those HCTPs, um, that are regulated under the Public Health and Service Act, Section 361, and then also 21 CFR Part 1271, are not eligible for RMAT or these specific, specific designation. So just keep in mind, it needs to be under investigational, um, investigational evaluation. And for the benefits, 
So here you'll see a nearly identical set of benefits as for a breakthrough therapy designation. We've got intense involvement with FDA, multidisciplinary process, um, FDA timely responses, and then again, that avenue or benefit of a rolling review. So quite similar. So to obtain our MAT designation, you'll see that preliminary clinical evidence is a requirement. However, um, it's a bit lower bar. So you want to demonstrate safety and efficacy with the potential to address the unmet medical need. This particular designation can be applied for any time before marketing approval, like breakthrough therapy designation. The sponsor requests this, and then if all criteria are met, FDA grants within 60 days. And I should also mention that this information and exactly what is um, required to be in those applications are included in the guidance documents. Um, so pretty, pretty clear about how to um, include that information. So there are some unique aspects of RMAT designation. Um, it's a novel program. It's pretty new. Again, it's the intent is to support accelerating um, the development of new innovations and advances to patients. So um, was brought up through the Cures Act. Now it's specifically created to accommodate CBER, so Center of Biologics Evaluation and Research Office tissue and advanced therapies. It's not necessarily to replace breakthrough therapy designation, um, but it is specific to biologics. And then again, coming back to it does not require potential for significant improvement um, versus existing therapies um, like breakthrough therapy designation. So a bit lower bar there. And I do wanna give an example of um, being involved with an RMAT designation. So this would uh, um, kind of think through the, the particular data set um, that was included. So this therapy was for was a human gene therapy. So it's really important, and the FDA kind of clearly um, includes this um, within that guidance document that to demonstrate a sustained effect um, or a durable effect for these human gene therapies. So for this particular um, RMAT designation, we and we had a handful um, of subjects because it was a rare um, indication. However, we had two-year data on that handful of subjects. And then on just a few subjects, we had up to five-year data. Um, so it was uh, suggesting maybe a lower bar, but you still need to consider showing, um, for example, this product showing the demonstration of a sustained and durable effect. Um, and then also as a comparator, they had about a 300 uh, subject cohort of natural history um, to show the um, treatment versus the natural history subjects. And then to kind of complete the circle here between breakthrough therapy designation and RMAT designation, um, just kind of showing a little table about the qualifying criteria. I hope um, I've made it clear that BTD is a bit higher bar. Um, so you want to demonstrate, your product demonstrate substantial improvement over existing therapies on one or more clinically significant endpoints versus RMAT designation. The product must be regenerative medicine therapy, but that preliminary clinical evidence just has the potential to address the unmet medical need. Benefits during development are quite similar. Um, and noting here just the RMAT designation, um, also within the guidance document, um, you could read a bit more, but there are some potential ways to support accelerated approval um, and satisfy some post-approval requirements. Um, and I know, again, David will touch a little bit more on accelerated approval. Actually, next. All right, I'll then leave it over to David if he has anything to add or to move forward with accelerated approval. Yeah, I think you did a good job, Jenna, so I'm just gonna jump right into accelerated approval. And um, this, uh, to my way of thinking, is the most valuable program that we're going to talk about today. And uh, it's misunderstood just the name accelerated approval, in my opinion, should be accelerated development and approval because it affords so many benefits to the company that's developing a product. Uh, it's been around since 92, uh, so it's, it's uh, amazingly well 
uh, experience. There's a lot of data in the literature and on the FDA website about it, and yet a lot of people still don't uh, understand some aspects of it. So I'm going to go through a lot of the aspects of it in, in pretty, uh, you know, maybe uh, too much detail. But the, the uh, meaningful therapy benefit over existing treatments is critical. And uh, obviously the standard of care is going to be reviewed at the time of submission. So if you beat something early on and something new comes along in the interim while you're developing your product, you're going to be out of luck. So what are the benefits? Number one, it shortens overall development time. Uh, you can get away with one versus two adequate and well-controlled studies. And in some cases, you can even get away with a uh, historically controlled study or a open label study. And there's a couple of questions that came in about real date, real world data. Eventually, I think that's going to make its way into this uh, program as well. But again, I said it's the most valuable expedited program in our experience. So what, what is it about? The, the, the terminology that FDA has used since 92 has been surrogate endpoint. And then recently in the 2014 guidance, they introduced this concept of an intermediate clinical endpoint. But however you refer to it, a surrogate endpoint in that guidance is meant to refer primarily to biomarkers. And I'll deal with that in this talk. But either way, they're, they're surrogate endpoints. The intermediate clinical endpoint is an endpoint that provides evidence that the development uh, may be successful and the product should be approved. So if it's a clinical endpoint, um, it's a measurement of a clinical uh, symptom or the, the, the removal of a adverse event or something of that nature. If it's a biomarker, it's just a, a lab value, and that's the distinction. But it generally allows FDA to make a decision on the approvability of the product with a lot fewer subjects and a lot shorter time period. And as a result, and this is important, there's a need for continued evaluation of the investigational product in the post-market phase, or as some countries refer to it as a conditional approval until it is confirmed or validated in post-marketing. And uh, if you have been following the news, you'll know that there have been two uh, oncology products, two PD-1 L1 inhibitors that recently lost an indication after a confirmatory trial failed to uh, con confer efficacy from a survival point of view. And uh, I think it's, it's rare that these confirmatory trials uh, cause FDA to revoke approval, but it's happened, you know, in, in maybe a dozen instances to date. But I will caution you that FDA is starting, especially the Oncology Center of Excellence, is starting to reevaluate accelerated approval. They have a new program that just started last month called Project Accelerate, and they are going to be evaluating the accelerated approval pathway and the international expedited development and approval pathways in concert. And uh, so be looking for that in the next uh, year or so. Uh, there may be some changes. It may take a while for the changes to occur, but be aware that it's being uh, evaluated. Dr. Pazder in the Oncology Center of Excellence is, is more interested in approving these products conditionally based on uh, risk benefit evaluation rather than just, you know, the evaluation of one surrogate endpoint or one intermediate clinical endpoint. And um, I think uh, that's probably uh, going to be in the news uh, in the next several months. So the product uh, must require significant time. So if you have a product that does its uh, thing in and confers efficacy in a couple of months, this isn't the pathway for you. What you're trying to do is cut down a long uh, development pathway to demonstrate efficacy, a long clinical trial that can take many months or even years to demonstrate efficacy. And so that's what these surrogate endpoints do is they truncate 
the evaluation. They give FDA a indication that this product is going to be successful. Now we get to the point of a validated surrogate endpoint or intermediate clinical endpoint required. And these are the surrogate endpoints that FDA has used to approve products through accelerated approval. So there's a track record for these sur surrogate endpoints that have been validated. Um, it can be you know, a laboratory measurement or a radiographic image or physical sign if it's a surrogate endpoint. If it's an intermediate clinical benefit, it's got to uh, be an indicator of the uh, of being able to reverse morbidity and mortality, and that is the essence of a validated import. So there's there's already evidence that exists. If you decide to use a surrogate endpoint or intermediate clinical endpoint, your study uh, must be using a validated surrogate endpoint or intermediate clinical endpoint. Otherwise, FDA will require you to validate this interim endpoint. And believe me, that is no small task. So a lot of people think that they have an indication that their product is going to be effective, but if it hasn't been used to grant approval to a prior product, You've got a long row to hoe, and the time that you expected to save is going to be eaten up validating your novel surrogate endpoint. And these are some of the validated surrogate endpoints, again, still using the terminology that FDA has adopted in 2014. So these are basically biomarkers. So uh, blood pressure, LDL, uh, forced expiratory volume in one second, I think, is actually an intermediary clinical endpoint, but they, in their document, which is listed here at the bottom of the page, call it a surrogate endpoint. And uh, viral load uh, is also an indication that has been used to get products approved, and then they are required to demonstrate the uh, robustness of this uh, therapy in a confirmatory trial after the fact, after approval. So this is the way FDA um, used uh, the diagram to demonstrate their thinking in their guidance. And uh, again, surrogate endpoints, therefore they're limiting it to biomarkers. So there's the big square, the big rectangle that is the world of biomarkers. And then there's the ellipse, which in, indicates the endpoints, the biomarkers that people think can potentially be used to substitute for a clinical endpoint. And there's a lot of them. And then finally, in the circle, you have the validated surrogate endpoints that I listed on the previous slide that have been used to get approval for a product uh, because FDA believes that they accurately represent the clinical endpoint that will eventually be arrived at after a much longer study. So that's a pictorial representation of what I'm talking about, and I think it's pretty uh, illustrative. Now, if you talk about validated intermediate clinical endpoints, um, there have been a number that have been used primarily in cancer. So progression-free survival, objective response rate, duration of response, and event-free survival have all been used to grant approval for an oncology product um, prior to running the overall survival confirmatory trial um, after the approval. Um, so these are also listed in that document that I'm, I'm pointing you to at the bottom of the slide. And then I just drew this up in in sort of analogy to the biomarker one, because this was not in the in the document. FDA considered them all to be surrogate endpoints. So there are short-term clinical endpoints. The, the large rectangle is the world of short-term clinical endpoints. And then there are some that people think or have a hunch that they may actually represent an early sign that the clinical endpoint uh, of efficacy is going to be reached. And these are the uh, potential 
substitutes for the ultimate clinical endpoint, like survival. And then you have, finally, the validated intermediate clinical endpoints that I listed on the previous slide. These have been approved by FDA and given approval to products to be on the market because FDA feels that they are definitely indicators, uh, absolutely, of the eventual clinical outcome. And this is really the advantage that accelerated approval provides to your company. And if you look at the top standard development bar, that's what everybody does most of the time, although it's starting to, in these days of COVID, it's starting to blur phase two and phase three, I think, to some extent. <clears throat> An accelerated approval is depicted in the lower bar, and that is where you meet with FDA early on at the pre-IND meeting to let them know that this is your plan and then meet with them in an end of phase one meeting rather than an end of phase two meeting and design the um, adequate and well-controlled or the registration study that you're going to run to provide them evidence of uh, efficacy for approval. And then you have your marketing application submission, it's reviewed, and uh, you save a lot of money compared to the, you save a lot of time and money compared to the standard development. Um, and you also get on the market much sooner and start generating income from that. Whereas the final bar is if you don't have a validated surrogate endpoint, you are required to do a surrogate endpoint validation study. And that may be as long as, you know, a couple of years until you get some uh, data on the final clinical endpoint, which could be survival. So that's a very long road down below, and it would eat up all the uh, time that you would need before you started your registration study. So how do you obtain accelerated approval? Well, there's no formal submission. As I said, you should start discussing this with FDA at the pre-IND meeting stage to get them aware of where you're headed. and. Uh, Approval may be granted with restrictions in addition to the requirement for a confirmatory trial post-marketing. You can also have, um, you know, limited distribution. You can have uh, only specially trained physicians allowed to administer it. And uh, quite possibly you may have a REMS assigned to this program as well uh, once you're on the market. And as, as I said, the sponsor must agree, you know, it, it many times is not an adequate, well-controlled confirmatory, but it's got to be controlled to the extent that FDA can believe the data. It may be just following out some of the subjects that you had in your registration study to uh, the end of life where they are, um, they are um, followed to survival. And then a comparison can make about how effective your drug actually does uh, in, in the uh, long-term clinical endpoint. As I said, there have been, you know, a dozen or so products withdrawn from approval, uh, usually because the post-marketing studies fail to show clinical benefit. So the, the surrogate endpoint is not ultimately validated in the pivotal uh, study. Um, however, the sponsor can also have the product withdrawn if they fail to conduct post-marketing studies, but this is happening less, less frequently these days because uh, FDA is watching this much more closely and monitoring the post-marketing commitments that companies are making. Um, it, the restrictions are inadequate. Um, they might ask you to impose more restrictions, or if that's not possible, they may pull the drug. Um, if you don't adhere to the restrictions, that would be cause for uh, withdrawing approval. And as always, if promotional materials are false or misleading, uh, that's true for any product. There's a chance that FDA will withdraw approval. So let's move on now to priority review. And this is accurately uh, named as opposed to accelerated approval. Um, priority review has been around quite a while as well, since 96. 
what it does is it truncates four months off the review by FDA, um, and it is definitely worth pursuing if you are um, eligible. But all applications are classified either standard review or priority review when they hit the door at FDA. Again, products are eligible if they have, are treating a serious condition. And this can be for a variety of reasons, but uh, basically a major advancement in the treatment relative to the available therapy. So if your product stands out relative to available therapies, uh, you're wise to apply for this, um, this priority review. Again, <clears throat> eligible products include uh, products that can improve safety or efficacy or compliance. Um, we had a product that we uh, were developing to treat uh, opioid addiction, and the fact that it was an implant versus a, a, a pill that, or an injection that individuals or a, or a sublingual tablet um, that that uh, addicts needed to take, this increased the compliance uh, because it was implanted in their arm. And consequently, uh, we qualified as a uh, um, priority review candidate because of the enhanced patient compliance. Um, but also, also safety, improved safety or efficacy is uh, typically what you see in these uh, justifications for priority review. And the advantage, unlike accelerated approval, it's four months, but that's still uh, four months that you're on the market sooner and you save the time uh, as well. So significant advantage. To get a priority review designation, uh, you can request it any time before the marketing application submission and uh, highly recommend you discussing it with FDA at the pre-NDA or pre-LA meeting. Uh, the review division will let you know in their day 60 letter as opposed to a day 74 letter that you have achieved uh, the qualification for a prior review. Um, I only caution you that this is resource limited. So even though you may be uh, qualified to receive prior review if FDA doesn't have the staff at the current time, you may not be granted it. So it's uh, it's still a negotiation up until the, you get that letter in your hand. You're unsure whether or not FDA is going to have the resources to staff this fast review. Um, now I want to talk about fast track designation. Um, this is another oldie but goodie. It's been around since 97. It's also uh, to treat serious or life-threatening conditions and uh, a potential, must have a potential to address an unmet medical need. However, in my opinion, fast track is extremely limited. Uh, most benefits that are conferred with fast track designation are already available without bothering to apply for this fast track designation. And, um, Largely, it has been replaced by companies going after breakthrough therapy designation or RMAC designation because they are truly uh, a, a game-changing designation, whereas Fast Track um, is not um, really anything. Back in the 90s, companies used to get a bump in their stock price when they received um, Fast Track designation, but Wall Street even has wised up to the fact that this really doesn't mean anything. Um, FDA will accommodate you if you have a meaningful, ther meaningful therapy that you're developing. So the listed versus the actual benefits of Fast Track. <clears throat> More frequent meetings to discuss development plan with FDA. You know, if you know what you're doing, you don't need more frequent meetings unless it's really uh, a, a difficult program. Um, and besides, if you have a meaningful product and you have good data, FDA will meet with you. Um, it, it doesn't have to be as frequent. I think in some cases, breakthrough therapy designation meetings are, are more frequent than they really should be. Because if you're developing your product, you know where you're headed, 
you should have a good idea and you just need to check in with FDA periodically to get their blessing. Uh, more frequent written correspondence. Well, again, FDA already provides adequate correspondence for products that are treating life-saving uh, medicines because they understand the importance of them. Eligible for accelerated approval if requirements are met. Well, um, if requirements are met, you'll be granted the accelerated approval designation regardless. So you'll be able to apply for that if you have a meaningful product. Rolling reviews for BLAs. Uh, I, I submitted a rolling review before um, Fast Track was ever invented, uh, an NDA. And so uh, the only thing I could say is maybe it allows BLAs to be submitted in a rolling review fashion. But um, I, I, I question the value of that. And in my experience, rolling reviews, unless you're in breakthrough therapy designation or RMAT are generally rolling submissions, as Jenna referred to, where you submit them and they sit at FDA until all the pieces are in. Um, and dispute resolution, that is already available as standard practice at FDA. So fast track to me is, um, it's not a big application. It's not labor intensive. You can submit it basically hypothetically in your uh, IND without any data to speak of. So it's it's not expensive, but it, it gives you about the same amount of value as you uh, as cost you to prepare it. Now I'd briefly like to touch on other programs for anti-infective products, just quickly to be comprehensive. Um, the Qualified Infectious Disease Product designation is, is obviously um, very valuable. It's been around since 2012. A number of companies have taken advantage of this. Um, and a list of qualifying pathogens can be found uh, in 21 CFR 317.2. Obviously, the whole, um, you know, antibiotic world is uh, changing around us as COVID has taught us. And uh, there is going to be a lot of uh, emphasis on products to treat infectious diseases in the future. So this is a very worthwhile program that um, affords you a five-year exclusivity extension. So on top of the five years of exclusivity that you receive for a new chemical entity, you're given five more uh, in, in uh, series. So a 10-year total exclusivity period, which is, uh, it's not quite the same as a patent, but it's, uh, it's still pretty valuable. And then finally, the, the limited population pathway for antibacterial and antifungal drugs. This has been around <clears throat> since, uh, you know, late, I don't know, 2017, maybe it was 2016, but uh, the final guidance came out last year. And it allows FDA to approve a product um, based on a small safety database um, and uh, I'll give you an example. We had a, uh, a tuberculosis, a, a uh, tuberculosis drug for a highly resistant population of patients. And uh, at the at the pre-NDA meeting, FDA mentioned this new program to us, uh, LPAD, and we looked at it. And basically, we could not see the advantage. We already had um, QIPD, so we felt like we had our exclusivity awarded already. And this wasn't really that, um, it wasn't difficult to apply for, but we just didn't see the need. Um, and then we um, submitted our NDA and uh, FDA sort of mentioned it to us again, that you really should apply for this LPAD program. And so ultimately we, we figured we don't want to, uh, oops, we don't want to look a gift horse in the ha in the mouth, so we submitted it because FDA obviously wanted us to submit it, and it was coming from the division director as well. And then we realized that the reason FDA wanted us to do this was because we had a very small safety database. We only had 109 subjects, I think, in our trial with extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis. And when we saw the comments at the advisory committee that came in, 
we understood that a lot of people have a lot of problems with small safety databases. And so this is actually a pathway um, for FDA to answer those critics by putting uh, labeling on um, the uh, product's label that limits it to uh, a very fine population and it makes uh, FDA a little bit less um, exposed, so to speak, uh, in the public. And then this is just a comparison. Uh, we talked about accelerated approval being important. Jenna covered breakthrough therapy, um, which I think is also extremely important. Our mat, I think of as uh, sort of breakthrough therapy designation light uh, by not requiring potential for significant improvement versus existing therapy. So as Jenna said, the bar is low, lower for, for breakthrough therapy designation and for uh, the bar is low, lower for RMAP than for breakthrough therapy designation. And then priority review, uh, cut four months off your uh, review, and then fast track um, is of limited benefit. And with that, I will wrap up and uh, ask if anyone has any questions uh, for Jenna or me. Yes, we will move on to the Q&A. There is still time to submit your questions using the Q&A tab to the left of your screen. We have a lot of great questions already, and we will try to get to as many as possible. For our first question, are there any expedited programs that a product sponsor can apply for in tandem with the EMA and FDA? I'll take this one. Um, there, there are not uh, currently, but that doesn't mean that it won't happen in the future. I talked to you about the fact that Project Accelerate, uh, FDA is, is, I don't know that they're coordinating with other regulators, but they're definitely evaluating uh, Europe's, Canada's, Australia's, Japan's expedited pathways, conditional approvals. And it may be that they bring this to fruition by interacting with the regulators and coming up with a harmonized, um, you know, accelerated development and approval pathway. I think that's a, uh, a wish of mine. I'm not sure it's going to happen, but it would be a nice goal, maybe under, developed under the auspices of the International Conference of Harmonization. There are other programs, uh, you know, Project Orbis comes to mind in the Oncology Center of Excellence, which reviews uh, marketing applications in parallel between the U.S. and Australia and between the U.S. and, and Europe. So those are starting to happen. So, um, you know, ICH started in 1992. It's only taken us 30 years to get to where uh, we're talking um, you know, and thinking about this to a, a real effective extent. And then, you know, there are things like uh, the orphan drug application. There's a combined application on, uh, on the FDA's website to apply for both the EMA and the uh, U.S. orphan designation. So it, it's, it's around, but uh, unfortunately nothing is harmonized with regard to these programs as yet. Thank you, David. For the next question, are there any risks that come along with securing one of these designations? I can take this one and then David add on um, as you see fit. So um, the, the product or development program must continue to remain eligible for the designation. Um, so that's one thing. And also I pointed out um, to think about those other aspects of product development. So um, your CMC, your manufacturing, you need to make sure that that particular component or those components are keeping up with your clinical development program um, and any agreements that you have with FDA to make sure you're meeting that marketing application target. Um, and then also thinking about completing those post, any post-marketing commitments. David, do you have anything to add or other risks? Only that uh, be careful what you wish for because if you obtain breakthrough therapy designation, it can be a lot of work and um, depending upon, you know, your particular approach to FDA, it can lead to, as you said, many 
many frequent meetings with FDA and just uh, it, it becomes a, uh, a real frantic effort. Thank you for those insights. For our next question, was the RMAT designation pathway really necessary in as much as the BTD already existed? Well, so the RMAT um, I mentioned, so that it's specific for regenerative medicine therapies and to really push forward those innovations and advances to patients. So it wasn't created to replace breakthrough therapy. Um, because actually, in fact, regenerative medicine products can qualify both for breakthrough therapy and for RMAT designation, but it was rather, it's an alternative, right? Um, so perhaps kind of a less burdensome pathway. I mentioned a higher bar for breakthrough therapy. Um, and let's see, um, just, you know, calling out RMAT requires preliminary clinical evidence, but not necessarily demonstrating that the therapy may provide substantial improvement. Um, and kind of in, in what the information we've gathered as well as in our experience, experience um, really the RMAT designation is predicted to probably be the better return on investment um, given the same benefits, you know, I talked through for breakthrough therapy and RMAT um, and uh, that kind of lower bar for that clinical data. Thank you, Jenna. For our next question, what percentage of the time is the priority review not awarded to qualified candidates due to FDA resource limitations? Yeah, I, I don't know that, the, I don't think FDA publishes that stat. So I'm sort of just going on my experience over 30 years. And I would say, uh, you know, maybe 10 to 15%, but it is a possibility that you should be aware of. Thank you, David. For the next question, what percentage of the time are products awarded accelerated approval withdrawn from the market due to the inability of the company to validate their surrogate or intermediate clinical endpoints in post-approval studies? Yeah, so as I said in the webinar, I think there's only been, you know, a dozen products that have had their uh, marketing, either their their product pulled or an indication, one of the indications of their product pulled um, by the FDA. And, and this has really not been uh, a real focus of FDA. In fact, for many years, FDA did not even track uh, the results of these studies. So that's why there have been so few. But FDA, as I said, are getting more diligent about this. And I think in the future, you can expect to see um, more products pulled more frequently. For the next question, under what conditions will a valid historical control be acceptable to the FDA? When I was speaking no. about breakthrough therapy, I'll go ahead, Dave, and then you can chime in. When I was speaking about breakthrough sure. therapy designation and RMAT designation, I brought up a few examples that I've worked with that both actually presented historical controls. Um, actually, in both those examples, those were um, in rare diseases. Um, actually, if you look in some of the FDA guidances for these expedited programs, they do call out the historical controls as consider they may be appropriate. Um, and and also natural history data, but really um, they want you to keep in mind that the treated population in that control are adequately matched to your treatment population um, in the terms of things like demographics, concurrent treatment, disease state, and then other relevant factors um, to that particular product. Um, so I think there's, you could probably find a bit more information um, in the guidance documents, but um, we have seen the use of a comparison between um, that historical control um, in a few, of, a few of the programs we've worked with. Thank you. For the next question, can you model outcomes from real world data? Uh, yes, you can model outcomes from real-world data. I don't know that it's any different for any of these programs than for standard programs, though. So that's coming. Um, 
it's obviously got to be really well done and really well documented and uh, it would not be an easy task I don't think um, at this day and age at FDA to get a product approved solely on the basis of model outcomes. Thank you for the next question. Can a request for AA be made after a phase two? Uh, yes, it can be made. Uh, it's sort of the horse has already left the barn if uh, you're done with phase two though, because the whole point of accelerated approval is to combine uh, phase two and phase three into one clinical study that uh, serves as your registration study. So if you've already done a phase two, uh, you're already down the path of a standard uh, development program and you're not going to be able to save as much time if you had met with FDA at the pre-IND stage and laid out your plan to avoid a phase two proper and a phase three proper, but rather a combined phase two, three study. Thank you for that response. And that was our last question. We had a lot of great questions today and we couldn't get to them all, but we will try our best to get back to everyone who submitted personally after the webinar. Thank you for attending this Fierce Biotech webinar and for submitting so many great questions. I'd like to thank our speakers for participating and Ro for presenting today's webinar. This webinar has been recorded. You will be able to access the recording within 24 hours using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Thank you again for joining and we look forward to seeing you at future events.